My name is Shemaine. My name is Devonta Triplett. Wanda Pie Star 66. A podcast from Ray Grand Training Center High School in Chicago. Hi, my name is Christopher. This is in the It's my favorite thing. One of my favorite things is music. Music makes me feel good. In this episode, we are talking with Sandra, Asia, and Georgie. Sandra is a Chicago-based singer, songwriter, and artist. Links to Sandra's music and art will be in the show notes for this episode at PowerYourStoryPodcast.com and in the episode description in your listening app. Enjoy the show. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I have had a very active morning. I'm an artist, too. I like to draw at home, and I... I like to do a lot of things set down dealing with art and stuff. So my first question is, why did you want to be an artist? Mm. I've always known that this is what I was supposed to do. So at around like maybe three years old, I think, well, actually around four or five, I started learning how to play the guitar. And uh, my father had taught me that's like in our family. So I always had that form of expression. I was already playing and singing at around that age. Around third grade, my father had ordered some magazines online or some books that teach you how to draw. They were sitting on the kitchen table and no one ever did anything with them. And I uh, was so curious. I asked permission to open it up, opened it up and taught myself. That's how I started out. And I loved it. I fell in love with it. I used to, you know, on the desks in school. Okay, guys, don't get any ideas from this, okay? But I used to draw all over my desk. Like, and I used to get in trouble all the time because my entire desk was filled with drawings and different images. And one of my teachers at the very end, when I was uh, leaving that class, she said, maybe you should study art, you know, and, and my teachers kept pushing me in that direction. But at the core of all of this, the truth is I needed to do it because I needed a different expression. I needed a way to express myself because life was not easy at the time I had, you know, I was living in a little village between Humboldt Park Little Village and, and Pilsen. And there was, a, I saw a lot, of, a lot of violence. So there was trauma all around me and I needed to find a way to express myself. Either that or I would just become undone. And that was, honestly, that's what saved me. Drawing and, and painting and making music literally saved me because it, I was too overwhelmed. You find that when you're at that place where you need to make a decision which way to go, and you're either going to be self-destructive and you're either going to drown or you're going to take whatever it is that you have and express it and do something with it. And I found my high was in creating work and expressing myself. And later on, I used it as a platform and started to talk about issues that bothered me. And I found that I had a voice, whereas when I was growing up, I never thought I had a voice. That's why I'm an artist. Yeah, I totally get you. Oh, cool. Yeah. So my next question is, um, how did you pursue the art for a living? How did you get started? A lot of where I am, being pointed in the right direction, had to do with mentors. I just met the right people. I just met adults that saw something in me that, at the time, I can't say that I didn't know I had it. I always knew that I had to walk toward health. And by health, I don't mean only physical, I mean emotional and mental health. And I always knew that, just intuitively, that there was something out there for me. And I was experiencing so many hardships that I knew it was hurting me. So I knew that I had something, but I didn't know what it was. And I met teachers and CPS that saw something in me and were like, let me mentor you. And they started to push me in the right direction. This was Francisco Mendoza, was one of the first artists that I met, the late Francisco Mendoza. And he wanted to teach me how to paint murals. So I did, you know, and I didn't know how to do it, but I tried it and I loved it, you know. And then he introduced me to Bibiana Suarez, who's a Puerto Rican artist and was teaching at the School of the Art Institute. And um, I started taking classes there while I was in high school. So I was taking classes in the college that I wanted to go to. I pretty much immersed myself so I'd go to school, but I'd take three periods of art. For lunch, 
I'd go to my art class. After school, I'd go to downtown. I'd take the, the bus and go to the School of the Art Institute or go to a museum and just absorb. On weekends, I was taking classes and I was also working in an art class in order to get a free art class. So it was like the hustle was on pretty early on. I just had these mentors that saw something in me and I didn't resist it. And sometimes we have the tendency, especially when we come from like a lot of trauma in our lives to self-sabotage, you know, we just sabotage everything that comes our way. And, and we're just like, you know what, we don't deserve it anyway. So we have a way of ruining it. So one of the biggest tasks for me was to get out of my own way. And it's still today, it's like, I have to get out of my way. And anything that I fear, I have to walk toward, you know, those are the things that I grew up knowing that I had to do. Yeah. And what fuels your passion to make you feel like you need to draw or paint something? Anything that's like, I believe in, in truth. So in expressing my own truth, there was a point in my life, like when I was younger, that I felt I had to make up who I was and lie about who I was so that people could see me as someone important and valuable. So I'd like exaggerate things. And later on, I, I found out that, yeah, that's not necessary. So right now it is about truth. And I found that as I was expressing that truth, I was really seeing myself as something wonderful. Like I was actually seeing my authentic self. So that drive to be authentic, that drive to be truthful, and in that truth to influence people, to encourage them to be that, because that's one of the reasons that I'm still doing the work that I'm doing. But the other reason is it's a way of expressing my discontent with things or if I think that there's an issue, a social issue that's not being brought to light, like there's an injustice that's not being talked about enough or that our community doesn't know about, then I come in and I try to talk about that. And, and this is a really good platform to do it, especially murals. Because murals are so big, they have such a huge impact. And um, so many people can drive by and see them. So you're literally getting hundreds of views, maybe thousands of views a day. And for those people who stop to really contemplate the piece, you know, you, you have to think about how to deliver that message quickly and hopefully influence some kind of social change or social awareness. And lastly, it's people like you. That's really a big reason why I do both my music and art. I've always, when I graduated high school, I started teaching students. So early on, I was already teaching. And my whole thing was, how do I lift up future generations? How do I lift up young people? Because that was done for me. And again, let me just reiterate, if it wasn't for the adults in my life, and if it wasn't for me being open to their direction, if it wasn't for me being able to look into their eyes and see how they saw me, I would not be who I am now. I would have been probably like a lot of people that I, sadly, that I thought had a lot of potential and they just didn't see their own potential. And so they're just still in that place of limitation. I wrote a song recently. It's a, it's a legacy song. It's, it's just about like the legacy that we leave behind. And a lot of that is what legacy am I leaving behind for our young people, for our black and brown people, you know, and that's, that's my goal. Thank you. That's what drives me. You're welcome. This is my partner, Carlos. He has some questions for you. That's my father's name. That's my brother's name. This is my uncle's name. That's cool. Hello. My name is Carlos. What's up, Carlos? And my question is, did you ever want to be something other than a artist or singer? Yes. <laughs> I'm one of those people that wants to do a million things. And I think our society is built in, in, it's very flawed, right? In that you have to, you know, get these degrees and you have to choose one or two things and you have to focus on that and that has to be your life career and that's how people value you, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's kind of tough. And then the other thing is that you're, if you're trying to build something, you have to focus on it and you have to put, you know, everything into it in order to make it into this empire, right? So there's that. But I wanted to be an astronaut early on. You know, I was, that was a dream. I'm, I'm really into science. That's my other passion is anything related to, to physics and, and biology. 
now it's like I look into, I love building stuff like carpentry and all that kind of stuff, but I wanted to be a violinist, things like that. But my focus has always been music and art, and, and it's something that I've always known I should be doing. So there's the things that I want to experience, and then there's the things that I know I, I am put here to do, and, and I am driven to do until I accomplish whatever it is that I'm supposed to accomplish. And my other question is, what inspire you to become a singer? Does it intertwine with your art? Well, my father, when I was, I don't know, five years old, maybe, I remember sitting on the floor and looking at TV, and my father was on TV. He's a singer. So I've always had nothing but music around me. I would wake up to it, I would go to sleep to it. Even though sometimes it was super disruptive. <laughs> my mom also is a vocalist. She plays piano, my father plays guitar, my grandfather played cuatro, so it's, it's in our family. But it's really about the way it makes me feel. It's incredibly liberating. And it's almost like, you know how when you have a very deep cry, like you just have that cry that's just like you have to purge, you have to get this out? That's what it's like. When you need to have a deep cry, do it through song. Do it through voice. When You know, when you have that joy and you're celebrating, like, yes, you can actually do that on stage with your guitar. Like, you're celebrating and you're feeling it and you're hyped and it's coming all out of you, you know. So that's why I do it. But also you have the same thing like murals. Like, they inform each other. Murals and my own studio work being about how many people you can talk to and how many people you can affect, it's the same thing with music. And it's also about this expression and this need to express. And my other question is, what college did you go to or where you self that? The School of the Art Institute in Chicago. I've always known that that was the school I was going to go to. In the same way, I went to Curie High School in the South Side, and I knew that that was my school because it was a performing arts school at the time. I did everything to get into SAIC. And I owe a lot of it to the mentors and the, the adults around me who wrote a lot of recommendations. They wrote recommendation letters and they helped me build a portfolio, which you'll probably need to do if, if that's what you want to follow. And they helped me build one and told me what it needed, helped me submit. That's how I got into the school that I wanted to. It really was the people that were behind me, pushing me and lifting me. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Okay, tell me your name. Brandon. Brandon, and your name? Christabel. Christabel? Nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you too. So my first question is, we've had uh, Sam... Sam Kirk. Yeah, Sam Kirk on the podcast before. How did you meet her? I met Sam Kirk, I believe. I met her at one of my shows, at one of my musical performances, and she was there. The reason I met her was because Sam um, had her work online. Like She's really good at, at marketing her work, and I had seen some of her prints, I think it was, and I thought they were awesome. So when I got off stage, I saw her and went up to her and said hi. How do you collaborate with other people or other groups with your work? How do you decide on like a part for each other? Yeah, that's one of my favorite things to do in both music and art is, is collaborating with other artists. I go into it enthusiastically because every single person has like their own gift, right? And they, they have their own vision that, that adds to yours. And that's like where the magic happens. I'm always looking for a collaboration. So how do you decide on who gets what section of the mural when you're doing a collaboration with the group? So we talk about it while we're designing it. So, for example, the last collaboration I did was with Sam Kirk and Andy Belomo. And I did the central figure, like, just because I, I like doing figures and I like doing um, renderings and realistic stuff. And, and they do a lot of design and line work. And Andy's a glass artist. And so they had designed the background. So it was already known that they were going to be doing that. And they, between each other, decided how to do that who would do what part. So you talk about it while you're designing it, before you hit the wall. And sometimes while you're at the wall, 
you look at it and you decide, okay, you're doing this. Okay, I'm doing this. I'm doing this on Tuesday. You know, okay, can you do this part? Because on Wednesday, I'm hitting this. And so you kind of work with each other. And my other question is, how many murals have you planted? I have no idea. I've been doing it for so long. They're all over the place, and a lot of them are gone now. The building's changed. If you had to estimate. I don't know, 15, 20 or something like that. And my off-the-top question is, um, do you feel like you've achieved what you wanted to in life from now, or do you feel like you, you could have done more? I don't know. I mean, we always have this thing like we're never satisfied and we always think like, I'm going to be a big star. I'm going to be this, this and that. And that's fantastic. You can't predict what's going to be put in your path and you can't predict some of the obstacles and how long it's going to take you to get over those obstacles. But you continue doing what you're doing. And so I thought that I was going to be a commercial artist. And I already had a vision for it. And it turns out that that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be, you know, a fine artist. I wanted to do the public art. I definitely, the type of work that I'm doing, I, that is not what I envisioned. I didn't know that it would be that. And I'm, I'm loving it. And musically, it's just, I just love where I am. I think it's where I'm supposed to be. As the opportunities are growing and I'm having more opportunities, I'm trying to prepare myself because you can't, think you want to be up here if you're not ready, if you're not developed enough. So I'm just little by little trying to develop it in the way that I want that reflects me the best. So you feel like right now you feel like you're at a good position or do you feel like... Yes. I love where I am right now. I love where I am right now. But like I said, I do have a vision of where I want to be, of where I'm going. But I also recognize that in order to be there, I have to be prepared to, to meet that opportunity. So as an artist, I have to keep Developing and getting better. Conceptually, that's like a big thing for me. I have to have those ideas. And they need to be well thought out, well planned. And musically, I have to make sure that I'm developing my vocals, that I'm developing, you know, my arrangements, that I'm getting better and better so that when something is demanded of me, I can actually meet it. So it would make no sense for me to try to throw myself there if if my work isn't where it needs to be. How many years have you been doing music? I started when I was five, but professionally, I don't know, 13 years maybe, where I've been like, okay, you know what? I think I'm actually going to try to record some stuff, or I'm actually going to do something with this. I'm, I'm digging the way I feel and the way it feels to be a musician. Before that, I was just writing, 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 and at home just doing my own thing with music because it made me feel good. But I decided to take it out into the public maybe around 13 years ago or something like that. All right. Oh, uh, what is your planning company? For the, the murals? Yeah, for the murals. Yeah, there's a bunch of different sources, right? So it all depends if it's public or private. It can come from a building owner, a restaurant owner. It can come from a Chicago public art group. will talk to us about some kind of a project that they have. Some of them could be from an, a grant. So sometimes it's a city, sometimes it's private or an arts organization, you know. How do you uh, select the area you they like to pay Emerald? So for D case, for example, for the year of public art, that was about locating a wall. We went around looking at the ideal location because you're thinking about where the sun is hitting. Is it visible? If it's in an alley, you're probably not going to want to do it because not a lot of people are going to see it, you know? So you have to think of the location, the visibility, And then you have to ask the owners if they're cool with you putting something on their wall. And sometimes it's the city where they want something like underneath a a viaduct. And so then they already know where they want it. Sometimes you just come into it and they're like, this is the wall. Can you do something on there? And then you look at the quality of the wall. Is it something that the mural will last on? Stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. Are you always satisfied with your work? What happens when something oh, doesn't turn out the way you want it? Great question. They say like artists are very critical. And so we're never satisfied with our work. At the moment while I'm painting, I'm never satisfied. Because then I just want to keep going and changing it. Because I know I can do better. I know I can do better. I know, I can, you know, that kind of stuff. It's almost like you could spend four months on it. If you give me four months, I'll do four months trying to make the perfect painting, you know. 
even in my own studio. Oh my God. Sometimes it could take me five or six months on a piece because I want it to be perfect. And that's not so good because then you're wasting time when you can be more prolific, you know, sometimes, but I enjoy that part. You just have to know when it's done, when you just have to back off and be like, that's good enough. You know what? That's good enough. And if I can do better, I'm going to do better on the next wall. I think this is good. Yeah. And then if something doesn't go the way I want it to go, it's paint. You just go right back over it. The only thing is if you're collaborating with somebody else and it's not the way you thought it would be, or when you want it to blend more, that's when you talk to the other artists. And then that's when you discuss where it can go because you don't have control over that as much. But over my stuff, I just come back with the paintbrush and paint it again. You can't go wrong. You just paint it again. Mistakes are the best thing you can have because you're stuck thinking the work needs to look a certain way. When you make a mistake, you're like, oh, dang, I should have, I can do this. I would have never thought of that. But it was the mistake that led you into, in that direction to do something totally different and expand your mind. So I always welcome it. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Elvis. Elvis. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Hey, so my question, my first question is, what does it mean to you to be an artist? That's a great question. It means that my responsibility is to create and to inform and to document. You document history and, and the times that you're living. You're contributing to culture and you're influencing or the potential is there to influence. So that's a huge responsibility for me, at least. It means that I have a commitment to myself to go inward, really be self-reflective and, and know where I am spiritually, emotionally, you know, so that I can bring out whatever I need to bring out, bring out that message or to make decisions on what to best reflect. It also, it feels like I'm in touch with something bigger, bigger than me, because I'd be lying if I said that that's all me coming up with these ideas or these songs. Sometimes I'll be dreaming it or sometimes I'll be sitting here and I'll hear an entire chorus or an entire arrangement. And sometimes I don't even think I'm capable of interpreting what I'm hearing and I have to grab my guitar or grab the piano or try to figure out how in the world am I going to bring that out? So I don't always know where it's coming from. So that's another thing about being in this position of expressing and creating. Yeah, that's good. Since you're now approving like, like how to make music and you're an artist right now, and that's great that you're like, like you're motivating yourself, like how to make music and how does it feel to be an artist? Oh, it's a weird title. Yeah, I just like to create. That's all. I just like to create. So if you're up on stage, there's something so beautiful about seeing the interaction and feeling it right there live with the audience. You feel the energy between each other. It's real. You can almost touch it sometimes. And it makes you perform a certain way. As a painter, it's not like that, though, because you're not really seeing the reaction. It's so more private, like a person sits there looking at your work and you're kind of on the outside, you know? And as a painter, let me just throw this in, that it's the hardest thing for me to do because it's so vulnerable and so personal. So a person actually sits there, they can be there one hour with your piece and you're just feeling a little like naked almost, like you're just vulnerable, like it's a part of you. It's no matter what you're painting, it's sort of like a self-portrait in a way because it is a part of you. Not so much because you're the one painting it, but because the, the thought, the concept, the feeling, all of that is you. So it's a super vulnerable place to be. Huh, that's good. What did your family think about your decision earlier in your career when, say, you wanted to become a musician and artist? Think about, like, I was maybe around your age when, when I told my mom, no, I was a little bit younger than you. I think I might have been 14 or 15 or something like that. How old are you guys? I'm 19. Yeah, me too. I'm 19. Okay, cool. So yeah, I was 14 or 15 around there. The way it's kind of set up is it's about like having that kind of career that brings you a lot of money and that money means success and all that kind of stuff. And that's what your parent wants is your parent wants you to be self-sufficient. My mom was like, okay, what do you need to do this? 
I was maybe 15 when I said, Mom, I really want to sign up for this figure drawing class. It's a new figure drawing class. And you need your parents' signature in order to do it because you had to be of a certain age, I think 17, in order to do it, 18. And my mom was like, okay, this is what you want. And I love figure drawing. To this day, I love figure drawing. So that was a big thing for me. She's always supported it. This is something that I've always known I should be doing. And there was just this one moment where my mom said, you know, you should have something to fall back on. That, like, shattered my world because I was like, what? You mean I can fail at this? Like, I was like, you mean, like, you mean I can fall? You mean I should have something like being an architect or something, you know, or something? I was stunned because I had never, never occurred to me that, you know, maybe it won't work out. It never occurred to me. And I remember that that planted a seed of doubt. (laughs) But other than that, just that one statement, it has been 100% behind me, you know, my family comes to my shows, they come to my openings, they support my work. They're 100% for me there, and they've always been. It was about my happiness. You know, they, they saw my focus. I wasn't out there to mess around and waste time. It was always about, like, becoming who I was supposed to become. And my last question is, where do you get your, your musical inspiration? Well, outside of sometimes you it just comes to me from somewhere else. Outside of that, the influences that I've had have been stuff like Stevie Wonder and Sting and Prince and Los Bukis and Jose Jose and God, so many, so many Aretha Franklin. Like, so a lot of what I love happens to be R&B, soul, jazz. And I love classical too. And the trios, from back in the day from my mom, my mom's era, my mom and dad's, and uh, a lot of Puerto Rican music, you know, Caribbean music. Uh, The inspiration, like what inspires me to create is just whatever I'm feeling at the moment or something that I observed that I thought was, wow, that should be a song. Like when, when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, it devastated my town. I'm from Utuado, Puerto Rico, and, and it devastated it. So I saw the way the current administration was, was treating my people on the island. And I would talk to my family, which we couldn't locate them. I mean, we, couldn't, we couldn't communicate with them for a while. So we were kind of freaking out. And I wrote a song about it. It's actually like an eight to 10 minute song. It's a long song. But that was like the inspiration, you know. The legacy song that I, that I wrote was about thinking of my nephews and nieces and what am I leaving behind for them because they're the future generation. So what kind of a person am I? What kind of a life am I living? So that's, that was the inspiration for that song, for example. And then there's your typical heartbreak song, like you broke my heart and, you know, you need to step, you know, like that kind of stuff. I have that as well. So. Okay. So you were saying about Jose Jose and Juan Gabriel. Are you a fan of these two artists? Yes, I love their music. Jose Jose, man, I, God, I used to sing his music all the time. Oh. And I don't know if there's a song that I don't know of his. And Juan Gabriel, that man can compose and the passion in his voice and how he can touch a person just through his vocals, even without them understanding the language, he can touch you. I would just like play his music over and over and, and just try to figure out how to be that, I don't know, that in touch with yourself and your audience. Oh, so you like to listen um Mexican music? Mexican, Puerto Rican, Colombian, Cuban. I love Cuban. Bomba y Plena from Puerto Rico. Like, man, I love that music. It's just so a little bit of everything, really. Oh, so you like to listen to all kinds of music? Yes. Oh, okay. That's cool. So thank you for asking my questions. Yes, thanks for your questions. So what is one of your favorite performing opportunities and why? One of my favorite. Okay, so there's this artist that I love. And I've had some great shows, but I wish I could mention the other ones. But this one in particular was special because I have been listening to this artist named Liz Wright. And if you haven't listened to her, you should. There's two Z's on her name, Liz Wright with W-R-I-G-H-T. Her genre falls under jazz, but it's so much more than that. Anyway, I have been listening to her. And when I would paint in my studio, 
I have my classical music that I love. I have my, you know, Latin music. And then I had Liz Wright and all these other artists on my playlist. Whenever her music would come on, I would be doing my paintings. I would really be into my work. She would come to Chicago. I'd go see her in concert. And then I have the opportunity, and I'm invited, that she personally invited me to perform, to open for her, and to get on stage and sing a couple songs with her and be background. I was like, this is life, you know, because I, I was nervous as can be. During, like, you go to sound check, like, beforehand, you, you go and you set up your gear and you do this, you make sure that the levels are where they need to be for each individual musician, etc. But there she was in the background, in the, in just like sitting there watching us perform. I was so nervous, but I felt really fortunate. Like, who, who gets to do this? This is just, a, it's a beautiful, it was a beautiful moment. Then when I, when I opened and I get to go up on stage with her, you know, you hear the caliber of musicians. You get to see how they communicate with each other without even talking. Like the instruments talk and, and you're seeing this whole thing happen and you're in the middle of this incredible exchange and communication, like this energy that's happening and, and the audience is giving to you. It's like this amazing musical symphony almost, you know? And you're in the middle of it and your voice is one of the instruments contributing to it. Everything harmonizes. It's, it was a trip. It was a trip. It was an incredible experience and an unforgettable experience. Yeah, and then the other thing was, like, I was backstage because they gave me the opportunity to just kind of hang out. And hearing her sing my favorite songs and, like, the curtains I could peek through, and I see her, like, side view because, like, she's facing the audience and I'm over here and watching her. And hearing it live better than the album and seeing her gestures and the lighting hitting her, I was like, man, this is magical and this is where I want to be. How do you balance the two passions at once? Mm, yeah, that's the hardest part. I've always been told, you know, that you can't do it because you need to focus on one. And there's, I've always been like, yeah, right, whatever, I'm going to do this. But there is, there is some truth to developing something, developing it, like raising it like you're a child, you know? If you have one child, you can put everything into it. When you have like a three or four kids, you're just like, let me talk to this kid and you're working with this and you're running to the other. It's, it's like that kind of a pool and you're doing the very best that you can to give the attention to both of them. I can kind of work with my day and divide it where maybe in one week I'm doing art, one week music, or one season, which is where I am now. One season is art, visual art. One season is music. And they kind of intertwine here and there. But it is a huge challenge. What is your best advice for someone who wants become a professional singer? A couple things. First off, practice. So this is like, don't just sing at home. Sing at home, yes. But don't just do that. Get out there and find places that you can do open mics, you know, or, or in school. Go out there and do it. Part of like, if you're trying to be a professional singer where you're out there performing, performing with the audience and knowing how to work with the audience is, is half the work. You can be the best singer, but if you can't be out there and connect with people, you're going to have an issue. You have to know how to do that. So that's one. The other is like, if it doesn't work, don't use it. So if you're singing and you're like, Man, every time I do this riff, it, I just can't hit it. You know, either hit it, like try to practice it until you get it, which is beautiful. But there are some things that just don't work. So just put them over here for now. Take everything that works vocally and, and just take that and, and nurture it and make it into into your your voice, you know, like it's like literally your signature. Just like know what you're good at and that's what you're presenting. Don't try to be like everyone else. Try to be real and, and in your gut you're gonna know you're gonna know if it's truly you because you're gonna get that feeling and be like, damn that felt good. Dang, that was that was something else. That's telling you this is where you need to be. So pay close attention to your body. Because the, all these sensations that you get, they're all like these affirmations of where you should be and where you shouldn't be. And that's in everything that you do. Pay close attention. You'll know what direction to go in just based on your awareness of your body. Yeah, why do I feel that you talked to me when you said those things? 
that's the way it works. Yeah, because all I do is <laughs> sing at home. I'm, my focus is on art. I want to go to Art Institute. Beautiful. It's a good school. You know, here's the thing. like, Just because it's the best school of whatever it is that you're trying to do doesn't mean it's the right fit. So research it. Because sometimes it's like, are they representing you culturally? Like, do they have your best interests in mind? And I'm not saying that they don't. It's wherever you go, just think about, is that the body, that you, the student body that you want to be around? Is that the faculty that you want? And are they producing, like, the type of artist that I, that I want to be? Like, just think about that kind of stuff. Because no matter where you go, all they're doing is giving you the tools. So SAIC could be $40,000. I'm not discouraging you because SAIC was so good for me. But if you can find another place that's going to give you those tools and be affordable, do it. If you can do SAIC and you want that, do it. So in other words, if it doesn't work out, don't be discouraged. You are you. The tools are within you. The creative genius is inside of you. So no matter what you pick up, be it like some crummy pencil, a piece of charcoal, some dirt, whatever it is, you're the creator. You're the one that's manipulating it. So it doesn't matter if you don't learn all these huge things that they teach. Those are fun. Those are great. And you can expand as a painter or as an artist or as a, a sculptor or whatever it is that you're choosing to do. You can expand it. But the genius is within you. So there's no excuse. So a lot of people will be like, yeah, I don't have these things to draw. I don't have these things to paint. I can't become a musician because I don't have the right guitar. I don't have, I don't have the fender, you know. No, man. Those are tools. The genius is within you to make anything authentically you and big. That's on you. Thank you. Yeah. What about someone who wants to become a professional artist? Well, get out there and do it. Be visible. Some people will say everything's already been done, so why are you trying to recreate it? You know, what I always say is like, in the same way that you're an individual and that you're an individual and you are who you are, none of you are the same. And that is, that is key. That is key to creating something that no one's ever seen because we're all so different. So imagine if you could take your voice, your, and I don't mean literally your singing, and maybe that, but if you can take who you are that makes you so different and you can be truthful in that expression, then your truth is different from everyone else's. So there you go. You have this product that's different. Be courageous in it. And don't be so critical of yourself. Like, don't be so hard on yourself because it's a process. It's a beautiful thing. And taking risks is the most important thing you could do. So don't be out there thinking, yeah, I'm going to do this at home, but I don't think I'm going to do that because what if I fail? Well, so what if you fail, man? That's, that's how you're going to be better. That's the only way to know what resilience is and how to be great is to fall. You know, you know how they say eat, drink, sleep whatever, your art, whatever it is you want to do, do it. Like, just, it's all you think about. Don't be distracted. Don't go out. Like, my, my thing, like, with my nephew, he's this awesome videographer. Like he's really good. Like he's a filmmaker. He's getting into that beautiful vision. And I used to always tell him, dude, how are you going to be creating your art if you're busy going out with your friends all weekend long? You're gone. And then from there, you're going to the movies, and you're going to do this. And you're gonna, I mean, how do you have time? to really develop your art, like get in it, do it, do it, get in it, become it. It's all you see and focus on it and be as truthful as you can. Be truthful, be truthful. So I have a question that wasn't planned to ask. It just came to me right now. So it's followed up by story. But anyway, how do you make your art or do you know how to make your art twice or even make it better because when I was little, I think my drawings was much better when I was 14 years old. But my mom actually threw my book away and those was the best ones I ever had. I cried. And mm. now I can't get back in that position at all. Mm -mm. Okay, so so maybe I am talking to you then because I've had my, my work stolen. Like I've had, I, I once was fortunate enough when I was, I don't know, 18, 19 or something like that to have some work in a museum. And it was an amazing piece that was stolen eventually. And I didn't think I could. I was like, dang, man, I, like, I'm never going to paint like that again. And it was, at the time, my best work. And that really knocked me off my block. On top of that, like, I spent some time homeless, you know, for a while. 
and I lost a lot of my work. And my sketchbooks, I might have had five or six of them stolen. Like, I've had a lot of my stuff taken. So what happens is, like, you, you kind of feel like, dang, man, I'll, I'll never get that back. And you may not get it back. But you can't be, like, stuck on your pieces. How are you going to grow? Your work is not for you. That's not why you're doing what you're doing. Your work is for everyone. Your work is for your classmates, you know. It's, it's for people around you. It's for the people in your community. And so you lose it, and then you create another one. It's like you're, you're an endless river of creativity, but you got to nurture it. You may have the creative, you know, you may have that kind of juice for it, but you have to develop it. And so you might have had your best piece, let's say, whatever. That is not your best piece. Crazy. You're so young. you got so much to develop. And make it better. One of the examples that I have is like in, in a lot of the portraits that I was doing, because I, I had a I had a moment where I just could not draw right. I was just never satisfied. I was like, this is kind of crappy. This is crappy work. And I kept practicing and practicing. And one time I had this gorgeous piece and I messed up the eye and I had to completely erase the eye. And I was like nervous about it. I'm like, I'm going to give up because in the past I've given up and I, and I have so many, I had so many drawings that didn't have like an eye because I couldn't, I didn't think I could match that one. And eventually I started like doing it and being like, okay, I messed up the best eye in the world. <laughs> it was like gorgeous, but this one was the right proportion. It was the right setting. And this other one, I either changed the whole face to fit this one eye or I lowered this one eye that was so perfect. And when I did it, it was better than the other one. I was like, I did it again for something else that I had messed up and it was better. And I realized that in my paintings, now I, now I do this, if I mess up something in the painting and it hurts me to whitewash that whole face and it's lost now, but when I do it, it's always better because your brain is a magical thing. And the way it makes these connections is unbelievable. So once you repeat something, your brain already memorized it and it's already making its corrections. And it's already making corrections that you don't even realize. So when you come back the second time, it's like, oh, I remember that line. This is how you do it. Let me just do it even better, you know, because you're, you're out of your brain is, or, or you're out of your head. And, and it's just like kind of intuitively taking over now. So repetition is a beautiful thing. And having like the guts to throw away or lose whatever work you've created and knowing that, shoot, I'm an endless river of creativity anyway. It's just developing, like making sure that your brain is communicating well with your hands and whatever it is that you, you do, making sure that, that, it's in, that you're in command of it. And, you know, I know how to use this tool. I know how to play this guitar. I understand the riffs. I understand this. I understand, you know, just always practice that communication with your brain and your hands and whatever it is that you do. You have to develop that. Like that is an actual chore exercise of getting like your thoughts out the way you want them. That's only through practice. But I will say one other thing. I know I'm taking up a lot of your time. <laughs> There's something to be said about practicing in your silence too, about creating without creating. You sit there. I did this for one entire year. And when I came back, I was a better visual artist than I'd been. But I would sit every day for about 10 minutes, five minutes, you know, and close my eyes and paint or draw, or write, or perform. You actually see your hand doing the paint. You, and, and you'll feel your hand, like, you'll feel your body moving because your brain doesn't realize that it's actually not painting. It thinks it's painting because it doesn't know the difference between sleep and wake. So that's why when you have these vivid dreams, you like, wake up sweating like, what the hell? Because your brain is like, did, that really, did I really just fly? You know, you think you're flying. So you do that exercise and, and, and you're like building these, I guess, synapses or whatever. Your neurons are doing their thing. Everything's firing and it's believing that it's, that it's drawing and that it's doing whatever it is that you're creating in your head. Like oftentimes I'll look at a person or I'll look at, like that, now I'm looking at a car and I'll study it and I'll pretend that I'm painting it. Every detail of it. What color did it take to mix that blue? What did it take to make that thing look metallic what is that and i and because i'm looking right at it as if i created that and it's perfect and it's real and it's rich your brain already did it you keep doing that exercise every day every day even vocals every day singing in your head 
is sing exactly as you want to sing. Like, if I could only sing like this, well, do it. Listen to it. Feel your throat expand. You know, if you want to pick up the guitar or whatever instrument or whatever it is you do, feel it, see it, feel your fingers doing whatever it is. You know, feel the heat when you're doing a mural in your head. Feel that sun beating on you as, as you're painting. Feel the brush on the wall and see yourself painting it. Finish it to completion. And every day do something like that. And you will be surprised at how that kind of a practice is just as important as drawing a sketch pad every day. And it's faster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you, guys. It's Bye. good. Thank you for this interview. Now you have started a podcast. It's produced by students at the Ray Grand Community Center High School in Chicago. With the production support of, from After School Matters and the Ukraine Imposter Studios. Our theme music is by Gennaro Jackson, aka DJ Sparks. Follow Kylie Story, Facebook, Instagram, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pandora, and Spotify. Our website is PowerYourStoryPodcast.com. Thank you for listening. And have a great day. <laughs>